you go start broadcasting. Sure. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we see your love, justice, mercy, provision, and victory. You are the God who lifts up those who are weighed down. You are the God who provides for all your children. Our desire is to praise you as long as we live. Inhabit our praises as we gather together today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So now we are going to uh, the psalm of the day, and I'm, I'm going to, we're going to line out the song. You can psalm, you can just repeat it. I'm going to say a line and you say it out loud, but some of you may know this one by heart. It's Psalm 100, the King James Version. So I say it. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. And now you repeat it. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. 
Know ye that the Lord is God, it is he that hath made us, and we not we ourselves. Know ye that the Lord, he is our God, it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are the people and the sheep of his pasture. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And his truth endures to all generations. Our first hymn is one you probably know, which is, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. sin, we are self-deceived and strangers to the truth. But if we confess our sin, God is merciful and forgiving. Let us together bow our heads as we confess our sin. Forgive us, gracious God, for too often we have cried, peace, peace, when there is no peace for far too many. Help us to mourn with those who mourn. Help our eyes to see ways to lessen the burdens of others and make us instruments of justice and peace wrapped in your forgiveness and grace. Amen. Let us now spend a few moments in silent prayer as we admit to ourselves and to God the sins that we need to get rid of. Let us be in silent prayer and reflection. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are, let us say, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And now I've got the good news, and that is, it is with joy that I let you know about the good news, that as far as the north is from the south and the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. Come new altogether. The past is finished is go and gone. We have become fresh and new. And now, as forgiven and new people, let us greet one another in the name of our Lord and Savior. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us wave. I'm waving to you out there in Zoom land. <laughs> I see. Uh, Zest, I see Zest over there. I see Frank, <laughs> Katrina, Patrice, Laura, 
and Karen Volk, Bonnie, Bob Volk, Allison Buckland, Joan Green. We have a whole crew of we people. We have a whole crew. I'm glad we did this, this again. And uh, they I might be some Atlanta Bartonites. And guess what? It's oh, nice. yep. It's nice. Tom and Eunice and Barb. And yep, we have oh, more people. <laughs> well, we just have a few concerns of the church. One is. Um, Katrina, our wonderful seminarian, has most graciously moved from being a worship leader to being our techie today in the second service. Thank you, Katrina, for your <laughs> me waving. <laughs> and that's the news. Today is Katrina's 50th birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And now symbolically, I'm going to give you the the plant. What's the plant's name? Isn't uh, that is it a bird of paradise? Bird of paradise. Yeah. We gave her a bird of paradise plant because it's it reaches up and it's this bright orange color. And in this time of pandemic, um, Katrina has been that for us, a bright, uh, a piece of bright color Hooray. that's reached up at a time that we really need. <laughs> and now we got some special music, Steve Howard. 1964. <laughs> It's from Matthew 13, 
And I'm going to read just the middle part. It's uh, at the beginning of the uh, 13th chapter of Matthew. And this is what Jesus said to his disciples, to the crowds. Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, because there was no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Anyone with ears listen. Jesus then goes on in Matthew to go on to explain what this means. It says that uh, the, the, the first, uh, the evil one comes and snatches away that which is sown in the heart. That's when it was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet that person has no root and it endures for only a little while. And when trouble and persecution arise on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke out the word, and it yields nothing. But as for that which is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, and who indeed bears fruit and yields in one a hundredfold, in another sixty, another thirty. Let us hear the word of God. So, um, as I mentioned in the first service, uh, John Denver made this popular and things that, but he didn't write it, and you are absolutely right. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is by a gentleman named Dave Mallet. But uh, so we, yes, Steve and I are going to sing, join in. We're going to sing um, inch by inch, row by row. ordained as an evangelist. I mean, that was the category. I mean, I was ordained as a minister of word and sacrament, a teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church. But my particular job was to be an evangelist because I was assigned, I was called to uh, be help a little Czech ethnic church on the east side of Manhattan in New York to, uh, to, to start to reach out to what they call Americans. Um, as if those who had been, as if they weren't American, but they wanted to reach out to Americans, and that was my job. So I guess I'm going back to my, my evangelist roots. It's all about the soil, is the name of the sermon. And it starts out with me talking about where Frank and I live. We live in a residential uh, area of Minneapolis. Uh, that has sidewalks. And where in Minneapolis where there are sidewalks, 
there is a piece of lawn between the sidewalk and the road, the street. And the homeowner is responsible for maintaining that uh, bullet, what they call the boulevard garden. Now, we happen to live on a corner in a big old house in a big lot. And that means that we have a whole lot of boulevard garden to maintain. We also have a whole lot of sidewalk to, to, uh, to snow blow in the winter. So please remind me, if I ever buy another house again, remind me not to buy one on a corner. Now, there's not much I can do about the snow blowing, but I have decided this summer to do everything in my power to eliminate as much of the grass on the boulevard garden so I don't have to mow as much. And so I have decided, I have started to plant so many lilies, ornamental grasses, perennials, and even a plant I found called a wandering onion so that there won't be any grass left to mow. Now, this has turned out to be a big job because no one has done anything for that hard packed, scruffy uh, soil and scruffy grass, uh, at least for the 15 years that we have owned the house. So our three-year-old grandson and I have spent many hours digging up the dirt. Well, at least I have dug up the dirt. Um, Aaron has taken a scoop and he takes the dirt that I have dug up and put it in the back of his toy dump truck. And then he proceeds to move the toy dump truck and dumps it in the middle of the sidewalk. Digging up the lawn is hard. Now I could have used chemicals and rented a rototiller, but I've decided to do it by hand. And what has happened is that I dig up these, these pieces of, of lawn and, and, and dirt and grass. Some of them are, are like bricks. They're so hard packed that you have to break them up with a, a spade or a knife or a shovel. And then I go on and break them up with my hands, pulling out the creeping Charlie and that nasty broad uh, leaf uh, weed. I don't even know the name of it. Broad right? leaf. It's called broad leaf weed. <laughs> it's all over our lawn. Now, there are some very good things about this. One is that this, this working of the soil gives my poor hands a very good hand therapy, physical therapy, because at my age, having spent a whole career writing a whole lot of sermons, in seminary, I was even a typist uh, for a summer, but writing a whole lot of sermons and uh, writing a whole lot of other stuff, um, my hands have suffered to some degree. But doing this has also brought me some new insights to our scripture passage today, which is the parable of the sower. Now, the parable of the sower is ostensibly about the sower. He's seeding his field. Uh, and that kind of seeding of the field by hand is in, in, in ancient and even current times an effective way of of planting crops. Throughout my career, I have read that this parable of the sower from the point of view of the sower, the farmer, the one who's planting. Because, you know, I told you I was ordained an evangelist. My job as a minister of word and sacrament and teaching elder is to, 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 to send out those seeds of the kingdom of God to share the good news. And sometimes it falls on a packed pathway. And 
And what I like about this reading of it is it kind of places the blame on the soul, soil, on them, about the lady who can't stand me and won't listen to anything I have to say. Or the other times when it falls on rocky ground and, and doesn't really take deep root. Uh, sort of like uh, when the, I heard the youth group um, at Peace Church uh, years ago when there's this big vital youth group, they went off to tr Presbyterian Triennium, the national uh, youth gathering, and it was full of like really inspirational preachers and they really got the faith and they came back really enthusiastic about, about their faith and they came back and their volunteer youth leaders were just so bored. Or there's the time the seed is scattered over by the neighbor's fence and the weeds creep over and choke them to death. And only occasionally do they fall upon rich, aerated, fertile soil so those seeds grow and thrive. I think it's a fair reading because it lets me off the hook but another equally fair reading is to read this parable from the point of view of the dirt, because it is about the soil. That is, it's really about us, all of us, who hear the word of the kingdom. We are the soil. And, and think about it. I mean, there's the, the soil that uh, has become hardened by being repeatedly walked on or simply, and the, and the seeds sit there simply on the surface waiting to become food, food for the birds. There's the seed that falls on rocky soil and has difficulty taking root because the soil, the, the rocks inhibit the growth of roots necessary for plants to access the nutrients in the soil. There's the, th the seeds that fall on ground covered in thorns that have to compete with well-established invasive plants, like those awful weeds in our neighbor's yard. But the seed that falls upon the earth that has been prepared, turned over and loosened until it is fine, replenished with nutrients from the decaying matter of leaves to vine. Now, I'm gonna take this in a slightly unexpected way because this is what happened in uh, the Bible study on Thursday morning. Again, I invite you to join us on the Zoom Bible study. We're not gonna stop that. We're gonna continue that throughout the summer. It's at 10.30 Eastern Daylight Time. I'm sorry, I was thinking it's Central Daylight Time. Um, because what it took a, in a direction that I didn't expect it to, because we talked about the stuff inside of ourselves that keep us from being fertile soil. And specifically, we started talking about the stuff in us that is rotten, that, that needs to be to, to, to be pulled out and, and, and thrown onto the compost heap. Uh, sort of like when Frank and I got home from vacation last week and cleaned out the refrigerator. Um, there was stuff, there was fruit that just had to be put into the organics recycling. It would be so nice if getting good soil was as easy, as simple as buying a, a bag called good soil at the gardening center. But a gardener will tell you it takes good soil, it takes years to cultivate good soil. It must be fed, nurtured by the, the remains of the fruit and the plants and the leaves that have been uh, broken down and it must be replenished because seeds grow and draw on its nutrients. And the parable doesn't really say anything about gardeners. Um, it only talks about 
sowers. But as the Bible study thought about the parable of the sower, we thought, what does it mean to be good soil, prepared to receive the words of the kingdom? How do we assess the kind of soil that we're in, that we are? What would we need to do for the seed to be able to take root in our bodies and souls? And how will we know if this is happening? And how might we nurture good soil around us? When our Bible study took this unexpected turn, it was what it means to be good soil, ready to take in the words of the kingdom. What we talked about, what we needed to get us, the soil, enriched and prepared for the gospel. Um, mature, mature compost can be a lovely thing. But the process of getting there can be pretty smelly and most unpleasant. And that's what got us to think about the parts of ourselves that need to be rotted away and transformed into something rich and life-giving. Examples in this discussion were brought forward that were like the opposite of what the Bible calls the fruits of the Spirit. You may have heard this in Paul's letter to the Galatians at 5.22. It says, the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We can add courage, wisdom, willingness to take risks. And in, the, in this time of pandemic and the moment following the murder of George Floyd, Maybe we need to think about the stuff that is the opposite thing, the rotten part, the rotten non-fruits of the spirit, the stuff that's inside ourselves that need to be pulled out and tossed onto the compost heap. Two such rotten fruits are self-centeredness and racism. Now, in this time of pandemic, the self-centeredness can be seen in, well, I like it because we can see it in other people. When they refuse to wear masks, when they don't make themselves keep appropriate distance from others and are in other ways carelessly risking uh, the spread of a dangerous and possibly deadly disease in others. That's... <laughs> Well, and it's so nice because you see it in others. You don't have to address it so much about the fact that it's also in us. But the second point, which was brought up by Mary Ann Christensen, um, was what she called the sin of racism. Um, it's what Jim Wallace has called America, well, he said that slavery is America's original sin and the racism and notions of white superiority that have come out of that, it is a lot more difficult to grapple with those issues than to talk about how those people don't love their neighbors. But this discussion led into talking about how important it is for us to look deeply into ourselves, to discover and admit the thoughts beliefs and actions that have been shaped by rotten beliefs, by shaped by beliefs, attitudes, and values that adhere in a culture in which we have been raised and lived our entire lives. Now, I'm gonna take a little tangent here and I ask that you indulge me. I promise I'll get back to what it has to do with soil in the parable. As I said, Jim Wallace has pointed out that slavery is America's original sin. And recent scholarship has pointed out, has begun to lay bare how hundreds of years of slavery, and then Jim Crow that was imposed when, uh, when the improvement of black lives began to improve during Reconstruction, and then there was a deliberate effort to end that and to impose Jim Crow has created in our, we've inherited into our souls a lot of rotten material. Some of it has to do with white superiority and some of the issues that are related to that. 
One of them is uh, the New York Times writer behind the 1619 Project. Um, and she has been writing um, about how the roots of slavery in the founding of our nation meant that the very beginning of our union, there was a whole stratum of people who got nothing and they did their labor for nothing. So from the very beginning, there was this massive uh, gulf between the people at the top and the people at the very bottom. And part of this has been an explanation of why in the world the United States has been willing to tolerate an increase in the gap of inequality between, uh, of, of wealth between the rich and the poor. When I was a teenager and there was all this talk about the war and poverty, and there was talk about how things were going to get better, we were gonna feed the world. Never in all my born days did I think that when I was on the verge of retirement that the gap between the rich and the poor would have been growing larger, not smaller. And it is in the United States the opposite, the, the graph is going in the opposite direction than it is in the countries of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Iceland, and even Mexico, where the gap is growing low, smaller, ours is getting wider. And for, I mean, we are willing to tolerate the fact that according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, 41 million people, including 13 million children, go to bed at night hungry. We should be giving our legislators what for and raising head on the street because there is, and then to make things worse, there is, we are on the verge of a shocking increase. I think we could even call it an epidemic of homelessness because our country is going to allow the beginning of evictions. It's about to begin. We are going to allow people who need to stay home in order to contain and level out and delay the pandemic, to allow them to be evicted from their homes because of economic loss caused by measures to contain the pandemic so people stayed in their homes. And the question we have to ask is why do we tolerate this? We don't, we can, we can bail out banks, we can bail out corporations, but why can't we bail out landlords until this gets under control? That's it. Hannah Nicole Jones, the New York Times writer behind the 19, 1619 Project delved into the lasting effects of slavery in the United States. I am thinking about this toleration of inequality and this belief, this, this willingness that we have. Perhaps we should treat it like a surgeon cuts out a cancerous growth. In biblical language, maybe that and, and these notions of white superiority, maybe they should just be cut out like a part of a vine that the Bible says that is cut and thrown into the fire. But considering the parable of the sower, I told you I was going to get back to the sower. Perhaps these beliefs and attitudes simply need to be composted. Let us name, break them up, work on them, let the air go through them, and place them 
in a pile somewhere in the cordon, corner of the garden, properly aerated, moved around, and mixed with good stuff in the hopes that they may replenish the soil of our souls, making it rich and prepared, turned over and loosened until it is fine and replenished with nutrients, with stuff that simply needs to decay. It is all about the soil. How we can work on ourselves. Removing that which needs to be removed, changing stuff that needs to be changed, adding stuff that needs to be added so that we may all become that rich soil upon which the seed of the kingdom falls and we grow responding with fruitfulness and fruits of the Spirit. Let us all receive this word gratefully. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. At this time in our service, normally we would pass around a microphone. Do you think we'll ever do that again? I doubt it. That is the one thing I bet we, it's going to be a long time since we'll be together in church service together anyway, but I don't think we're ever going to pass around a microphone again. And we share with ourselves concerns that we have. I've heard there's a church member who uh, has a family member who's left the home and she's very, very worried about him. There are those who are sick, those whose friends who are sick, um, we've heard that um, in Minnesota, our, our, our infections with the pandemic continue to go up. Um, there are joys to be um, a credit where credit, well, there is a joy that President Trump wore a mask in public. And it is becoming far and far more common. The city of Duluth is considering making it a requirement when people are outside or, or in buildings in public accommodations to wear masks. Uh, there is an increase in understanding that the virus uh, is not quite as responsive to surfaces as we thought it was, but that it is aer aerosolized. Our friend who does the closed captioning said she had to learn how to do that one, that word. She has an abbreviation for aerosolized. It has to do with, with moisture that stays in the air and we breathe it. That is a joy that we have some increase in understanding. And there is a kind of unanimity of opinion among scientists that there will be some kind of of a vaccine in a remarkably short period of time. And of course, remember, vaccines don't, don't cure everybody. It doesn't prevent it in everybody. I mean, even flu vaccine doesn't work all the time. But it, there may be tools available to us sometime. But then there's a concern about, I, I'm a particularly um, sympathetic to teachers and to families with small children who um, there are questions about how to send them to school, um, especially for those who are disadvantaged, don't have internet connections, if there's going to be some kind of long distance. I mean, it's just, it is just a mess. So let us pray for all of those concerns. In our own congregation, we pray for all those members who are on the front lines, ranging from Jake Hamilton, who bags food at Cub, grocery store, all the way to David and Robin Councilman. Uh, Robin works at North Point uh, as a family practice uh, physician at North Point Health Center, which has the highest rate of COVID-19 infection in our entire community. Let us bow our heads and pray. Gracious and merciful God, we know that you know our concerns before they fall. A word falls from our lips. 
we pray for the world, our nation, community, church, friends, strangers, for our families and for ourselves. We need you now more than ever before, for indeed the times they are a changing. And we need direction, we need help, we need inspiration, we need courage to break up that rocky ground and to get underneath into our hearts and souls to make changes that we don't even know that we need to make. Open us up, gracious God, so that we may find creative ways to help people who are sick, that we might be conscientious to participate in the political process so that our beliefs and values may be articulated in a non-partisan and non-parochial way so that our entire society and world may be improved by the influence of your spirit. We pray for those who are sick, those who are going through tough times, for families in strife, for people facing addiction and sickness. We pray for the caregivers, for the frontline workers. And lastly, we pray for all those we love, that you may keep them. And we pray for ourselves, that we might be made into rich and fertile soil, so that we might hear the word that you seek to plant in us. We pray all things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to have a little special music right now during our offertory, our play pretend offertory. We don't pass the plate. Although at the service earlier, we passed the fish nets uh, and took an offering from people's cars. Um, but uh, please, I know that our church, our church has been uh, continued to be very faithful in your mailing in checks and uh, coming by the church to drop off in the uh, mail slot, which is right by the front door of the church, our offering. Uh, and let's just play pretend and imagine we're passing the plate as we hear some music from Steve. It's a lonesome tune, but a wise one. So Neil Young wrote this tune in 1971.
sharing with us playing from the guitar and the banjo reminds me something I've learned this year from Winston Marsalis. He said that um, the, th those are two, two instruments that represent a character of American culture, that the guitar is from Europe and the banjo has its roots in Africa. Right. And it's really the combination of the two. And that's really an important part of who we are. Let us now bow our heads in a prayer of dedication. God of new life, out of the abundance of our lives, we offer our gifts to you. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source of hope and love for this church family and in the community beyond us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And we're going to sing our closing song, which is, I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. Take it away. <laughs> And so I'm going to share with you the benediction now, the good word. And, you know, when we started these Zoom services, I said, don't go out into the world. Stay home. But we, some of us do need to go out into the world now. Some of us don't, but some of us do. And if and when we do, be careful. Wear face masks. Be concerned about the people that you stand near to keep not, I hate the term social distancing, it's physical distancing. Let us create social bonds at a greater distance. But in whatever way we go about our lives, let us be in peace. Let us have courage and hold on to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Let us greet one another 